welcome to another Sofa Sunday. And today I'm lucky enough to be talking to someone who is very familiar to LMP audiences, and that is the magnificent Howard Shelley. Hello, Howard. Hi, Ruth. How are you? I'm very well, and you, surviving lockdown. Surviving, just about, thank you. Yeah. Um, now, we, we thought it'd be so lovely to talk to you because, of course, so many LMP friends know you, well, they think they know you really well, but what we want today is for them to just find out that little bit extra that you don't disclose from the concert platform. <laughs> so, right. Um, I, I, well, I hope some of them will forgive me if they've heard some of it before, because it doesn't sort of change. You know, my life was what my life <laughs> Yeah, was. but you know, I'm going to get the real nitty gritty out of you today. Uh, um, yeah. So just going back a little bit, I wanted to ask you whether you come from a musical family, whether you, you know, how you started playing in the first place. Yeah, well, there was a strong uh, musical gene in the family. It came entirely on my mother's side through her father, who was an organist. And uh, my my father was not musical at all but he was an artist he was a painter that our house is still full of his paintings and he won the top prize at the Royal College of Art actually and as a student um, so you know he was in the arts but not actually music he loved hearing music but he he knew nothing about it but my my grandfather who I never knew mm -hmm. uh, I, I was as an organist as I said and, and I wanted to play the organ from the moment uh, I was aware of things like that and until my legs could actually were long enough that my feet could touch the keyboard the the pedal board of the organ I had to wait so I played the piano meantime right because it fascinated me as an instrument and the first piano I ever knew actually was in the place where my parents sent me to be looked after as a, a as a kid and it was a piano with one of these pianolas built in. So it was a bit of machinery as well. And I loved machinery from a very early age. Amazing. And it didn't work very well, but I was intent on trying to get it to work, you know, where you push the pedals and it sort of wheezes and a, a, and a sort of a piece of paper goes round and inside the instrument. And it, and it plays its own music. It's quite impressive. Just to finish the connection, my mother, although she wasn't a professional musician, I think she could have been if uh, women were more, more going into the profession at that time, which they weren't. But uh, she was a very fine cellist in her own right and, and played beautifully and used to play and uh, help out in the school orchestras as I grew up and went through Highgate School here in North London. So you were surrounded by art and culture, basically? Yes. Yes, I was. Which, which helps, doesn't it, at the, at the beginning, I think? Yes, though, you know, when we talk about surrounded now, People of your age and, and even younger uh, are, are so, I mean, thinking back to, to hear a particular piece of music, you couldn't just go onto the internet or anything. I had to book, yeah. you know, especially for unusual pieces of music, I had to book with the local library to get a record sent from some other part of the country. I had yeah. to know about it first. There was no natural source of knowledge. And yeah. it was very hard work as I was growing up to yeah. get to know certain types of music. I mean, things have changed hugely in my yeah. lifetime and, you know, for the, all for the better from that point of view. Yeah, all for the better, apart from maybe the fact that so much live music can now be accessed for free. And I think that's, that's something during this pandemic we're seeing is, is how can we expect people to pay to listen to performances when so much is available on the internet. So mostly for good, but, but sometimes I worry that there's just too much available. So um, were there recordings that inspired you when you were you know, younger um, or, or still inspire you now? Who, who were your sort of heroes of the piano? Well, do you know the first record I remember listening to on an old wind up uh, gramophone, again, the mechanical side of winding up this gramophone was fascinating to me but it was a, 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 an old LP of um, Smoke Gets In Your Eyes. Do you know oh, that tune? Nice, Shirley Bassey. Yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah, I think of Shirley Bassey singing that. Yeah, well, she wasn't, I don't think, the original no. artist no. on that. I'm sure she wasn't. A, a long time ago, but it, it's a gorgeous tune, you know. Mm. It's not classical music, of course, but it's the, the next best thing. I mean, it, Rachmaninoff could have written it, quite frankly. Yeah. Are you a bit of a dancer uh, then, Howard? A bit of a dancer? Are you a bit of a dancer? Uh, 
No, no, no. never, alas. Oh, sad. Um, <laughs> but it's a beautiful, soulful tune of the type that was around in those days post-war, you know. Um, and, and, and this fascinating wind-up gramophone. Uh, but my parents also had a, a reasonable collection of, um, well, they were 78 records back there, mm -hmm. of people like Rubinstein and mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of other famous pianists, Richter, Moisevich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful pianist but of course you only played a few minutes at a time four and a half minutes on one side and you had to be very careful of those records nothing like nowadays when you can throw these machines around and the CD will still be all right in the middle of it You've got an absolutely vast discography. I mean, is there a recording that was a particular challenge or one that was particularly satisfying that you're really proud of or, or one that you want to throw in the bin? I'm just interested. Or did they all turn out as you hoped? Um, I can't think of any that I would have wanted to throw in the bin, actually, to be honest. Although if, it, if you'd asked me 40 years ago in my early recordings, I would have wanted to throw them all in the bin. But I've... <laughs> I've matured, <laughs> or at least um, I've discovered that what I think at the stage immediately after recording, and I'm sure you and a lot of uh, our fellow musicians will agree, you know, when you've worked on it so hard learning it, and then you've worked on it so hard in the studio, then you've worked on it so hard listening to the edits over and over again and thinking, mm. is that better or is that better? For Because there are different reasons why a particular take will be better than that. By the time you've finished that, you're so close to it all, you can't possibly stand back and listen uh, to it and uh, come anywhere near enjoying it. Mm. But as somebody who's been recording for 45 years, I can say that there does come a time when you can listen back to those old recordings and, and hear them as if there was somebody else playing them and really enjoy them. And um, as I've made so many now, yes, I, I'm more used to it and I make allowances for that along the way and I can enjoy them more quickly after I've made them so that it still needs a month or two. Is there a particular concert you know that really stands out in your memory or is that a ridiculous question perhaps it is a ridiculous question you've done so many concerts. Well no I think I know what you mean a lot of lot of very interesting concerts I mean we played the first western musicians to go to outer Mongolia when we were really, really quite young, at the end of a tour of Russia, we went on to out, out of Mongolia when it was minus 45 degrees there and people were wow. sort of dying when their tatty old cars broke down out there because it was still, it was a, a, a satellite communist outlier country there of Russia. But actually, yeah, that was fascinating. There were, there were, their, their concert hall was a smaller version of the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. And the standard, was incredibly high because it was the Russian method of teaching, which uh, brought people on brilliantly. Uh, um, but the, the 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 interesting thing was getting there. I mean, we were late by days arriving because of the terrible weather across Russia, wow. and we came down places like Omsk and Irkutsk and. The British ambassador, because nothing was known in those days about when aircraft might or would would arrive or wouldn't arrive. Mm. The British ambassador had the welcoming party for us two days before we actually arrived and our first concert we weren't there to do. Oh my God. But, um, it was, that was an amazing experience. But recently I did a concert in Gibraltar inside the rock in an amazing cavern. I don't know whether you've been there, uh, but that was a fantastic experience. But I think probably um, the most moving thing for me was giving a concert in Salzburg within a few hundred yards of Mozart's houses, you know, mm. and to play Mozart in Salzburg, walking across the river. It, I'd done the first concert, so the, the potential strain of doing it for the first time at the Mozarteum was, was um, over, and it had gone well, and I uh, was going for the second performance on a Sunday morning. It was a brilliant sunlit morning as I crossed over the river. And as I came up, the road where the second Mozart house, where he moved to later in, uh, in his youth, really it was still, um, or in his young manhood, um, and walked up the road with this beautiful Baroque church at the end with uh, two towers either side, the bell started ringing. And 
I just found myself in tears with the beauty of it all. You know, the thought that I was playing this wonderful music in the birth town of this extraordinary genius. And here I was up in the mountains on a sunlit morning, looking forward to repeating this music. And as I walked up the street, the bell started ringing. It was just absolutely entirely magical. Um, and many of the LMP audience members will know your lovely wife, Hilary. And I was just curious, because I know she's a fantastic pianist as well. How did you meet? And um, can you just, just tell me a little bit about that? Well, we met, we, we met way back in college, the Royal College of Music in London. Uh, and we happened to be with the same teacher. And <laughs> Hilary... Who was that teacher? Uh, that was a man called Kendall Taylor. Right. Very fine teacher, very good on detail and training your ear uh, for playing the piano, which is a very specific thing, you know, compared to you fiddle players or string players, uh, you, you have to uh, work out quite a considerable amount of artifice to, for instance, the most obvious is, you know, when you hit a string, you then have no longer any control over it. Whereas you, uh, string players can can still make the note live and come louder and all sorts of things with it add a bit of vibrato um on the piano it's all done in that split second you ping a note with your finger everything has to be in that touch so uh, i don't know why i got onto that but that's he was he was very good he would often stop me on my first note to the point where I eventually I got quite nervous ever playing anything to him because he, I'd play the first chord and I knew exactly what he had said. You know, the, the third of the chord isn't quite loud enough how the bottom note could be a little bit weaker. And then, and after I played about a bar, I could tell you what he was going to say about how awful it was <laughs> in so many respects. And you, you know, you, you tense up and you can't do any of it, but, but I, he was a wonderful teacher and, uh, but Hillary uh, had already won when I arrived at college as a 16 year old. Uh, she was a little older than me and she had already won the top prize in college. I think she was just about to leave, but she had close associations with, with the college. And um, although she was a girl from Dublin, in fact, and had been playing, I mean, she just started playing the piano very late. Uh, she was 10 or 11 when she started, but she was playing on television already on the Late Late Show in Dublin, live uh, regularly in her teenage and things. Um, but uh, I was aware of her quite quickly because she was devastating attractive, needless to say. <laughs> but I thought she was quite out of my class, absolutely out of my class. Um, and uh, there, there was, I was far too shy anyway, I think, to say hello to her. But some, somehow we were thrown together at one point and the, Amazingly, there was a spark between us and she um, was gracious enough to uh, be very sweet with me. And we, we, uh, we just felt a meeting of spirits, you know, the, that, that soul, whether we were soulmates from our first meeting. And fortunately, it, it went, uh, it, it turned out to be the case. LMP when did you first play a concert with LMP and what did you play well we were looking at that recently I went back into my records it was way back when I was 25 um, and it was with Harry Blake I think it was the a major piano concerto of Mozart K488 right um, and uh, I, I remember it being a very happy time and I did another concert with them quite soon after that when uh, that was a local in North London here at a venue which actually put on very fine concert series called Hornsey Town Hall. It's still standing there. Tragically, they stopped, they, they had to close it and, and they stopped giving concerts. Um, but I did uh, that and that was directing as well as playing. Uh, so that was my first concert with them and I've, I've really worked regularly since then. I mean, obviously in those early days it wasn't so often, but uh, over 45 years now it's um, been so, non-stop non-stop so, relationship 
the option. You, you were play directing from a young age, it sounds like. Um, what, what, what point did you then cross over into conducting? <laughs> Go over to the dark side, you mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I actually conducted a lot as a teenager. Um, I remember being I, I remember being called when I was about 13 yeah because the boroughs were very strong on music and Haringey was um, had a good music department and uh, they knew about me because of scholarships I'd won and, and grants that they'd given me to college and things the man who ran it and I would occasionally get a phone call when I was very young and, and he's, he would say would you come and we, we've lost our conductor for the youth orchestra tonight now go along and Condensers, conduct something at short notice and then a local operatic society asked me to come on the day of their first performance and conduct uh, one of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas I think it was Pirates of Penzance but I wouldn't swear to it now and I I just had to learn it uh, on the day of the concert wow. and and uh, semi-professional orchestra in the pit and uh, and take over and I, I love doing that sort of thing I mean I was I was a great learner from the days when I was at school because when I was an eight-year-old, I would sometimes turn up to school. We had this lovely uh, music master, but he was a bit of a <laughs> unreliable guy when it came to arriving at school in time and things. He drove lovely cars and things, and he was quite a, a figure to look up to as a young musician, you know. But he was a bit unreliable on some sides. So I would quite regularly get called up in the, at the morning service when he was supposed to be playing the hymn because he hadn't arrived and I would be you know after the happened a few times I was my I could already feel heart pains and I would the headmaster would call out Shelley are you there come and play this hymn would you and it could be anything you know Jerusalem was the one that I feared worst of all because that's that was fiendishly difficult to play as an eight-year-old I can tell you with that introduction and thing so I began late at night reading through the hymn book and although it was a terrible sweat in those days, and it, it did used to worry me, um, uh, it was a terrific uh, training experience because mm. it mm. taught me to sight read like nothing else would have done, I think. Mm. So I, the, the point I'm making is that uh, I learned to sight read music very early. You really do take things in your stride. I mean, you are remarkable what you do. And I think that the, the big thing that's worth talking about is um, your lovely birthday celebrations recently with the LMP. Now, just for those that weren't there, just tell everybody what, what you did in a day. <laughs> well, we, we, we discussed, uh, Julia, who is managing director of the orchestra, we discussed at some stage what we should do for my 70th birthday to some sort of special occasion. And, and we've played all the Mozart concertos and things. And anyway, that you couldn't do it on one occasion. But I thought, well, we could perhaps do all five Beethovens. We, we do them fairly regularly anyway. We could do it all on one day. And, and Julia thought it had wheels, the idea. Um, uh, so, so we put it together and, and we did. In fact, we broke it up, didn't we, into three chunks. Oh, actually, you weren't on, were you, Ruth? Sadly, sadly, no. I wasn't there. I know. Very sorry to miss that had, one. We could have had all our wonderful leaders on. But, uh, <laughs> um, but we, yes, we did it in three chunks. And uh, it was very exciting. We, even when I walked out on the platform to begin this, there was a really, truly excited uh, uh, response from the audience. Fantastic. It was as if... You know, they knew that we were all in this together. We, we were like setting a, it's not a world record, I'm sure, but we were like going in for the burn, you know, all of us. Mm. And it wasn't just me on the platform and the orchestra, mm. that it was an exciting mountain to climb, if you like. And that set us off on a wonderful note. I had a slight nightmare beforehand. I, Hillary was in hospital. Uh, we had... We'd had both our cars stolen. It, it was the preparation for that was just unbelievable. I was in Sweden and and trying to deal with these things on top of actually giving a con three concerts with a lot of Mozart concertos in. Um, so uh, and Hillary had pneumonia and other problems and unfortunately couldn't even be there. Uh, but once it started, a few seconds before you you say I can. 
you know, I take it all in my stride. I, it's not it quite is. as simple as that. We, well, we, we, we all appear to, don't we? We can't let our, our problems show. I did actually tell the audience a little bit about it because five minutes before the concert, I was saying to anybody who'd listen, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I just need a, like another day to get myself ready for this. I just didn't feel, not that I couldn't play the concertos, but that I wasn't prepared for what I was going to say and things like that. Yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to push it back a day. But uh, as musicians, musicians, we can't put our performances off. They're, they've got to be when they are, no mm. matter how you feel. So, um, but this, this welcome from the audience was so fantastic that it set us all, I think, up on mm. stage to to give our, our best and it was just you know it's incredible and then people got up the orchestra started playing happy birthday uh at the end and everybody sang happy birthday to me which was really lovely because my birthday the very next day it was a it was a fantastic uh um celebration at the towards the end of my career you know i had exciting things happen at the beginning of my career and it's sort of as like um, book stops either end and and the fact that i could still do it at the age of 70 was uh, reassuring to me as well as probably to Absolutely others. Absolutely magnificent, the... yeah. pandemic has it changed your um outlook at all do, do you want anything different from your life now or or do, are you just champing the bit to get back to the concert platform well i'm i'm worrying i was worrying even you know when i was still going and doing concerts in those last few weeks because i had a concert in milan uh, uh with a german orchestra cancelled the week or two two weeks i think before our london concert and thank God I did, because that turned out to be the epicenter in Europe, you know, mm. in those early weeks, uh, mm. the north, north of Italy there. Um, so I was beginning to worry about that. And of course, Hillary having a pneumonia anyway, a serious pneumonia, which wasn't coronavirus, uh, meant she was um, very vulnerable. Um, but now I find myself thinking, what would it be like if I was flying to Australia, uh, you know, 24 hours on board a plane with hundreds of other people mm. when one knows already that planes are disasters when it comes to uh, 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 you know picking up infections and things mm. Mm. so it does worry me travel hotels you know yeah. where our hotels are going to be open because I mean obviously we want to get back to work as soon as possible and I hope that uh, I'll be able to record with orchestras before even we can go back into the concert hall mm. And I read today that the Albert Hall may have to close, you know, as a venue. I, that it, the way it would have to work with social distancing just means it's, it couldn't be a, 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 an economic enterprise anymore. Gosh, I hadn't heard that. That's terrifying. Well, yeah, one assumes, I think people assume that places like the Albert Hall are somehow well looked after. They're not. They mm. have to survive as we individual musicians do on the concerts and the income that each concert or performance they put on there brings into the hall it it, yeah. it works on a bit of cliff edge which is why you know a lot of these halls don't do the maintenance work sometimes as needed uh, sooner than they do um, what about when you got your OBE what was that like exciting I'm sure that was amazing uh, quite horrifying I um because it came entirely out of the blue and I was at the same time thrilled. And I think when you read anybody's reaction to getting something like that out of the blue, you think, well, do I really deserve it? Uh, and you, you think of all the things that other people have done that are far more noble and things than uh, um, playing music. And um, although I don't want that to sound the wrong way, it, it is a noble, uh, it is a, a, a a noble profession in its way, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah, more deserving of prizes for what they've done, I guess. Mm. But no, it was it was it was beautiful. And and also uh, your fellowship of the RCM was that an, was that a that, that was hugely yeah. 
And it was uh, Prince Charles gave me that, and he was absolutely charming because uh, my slightly mad first piano teacher, who was mad in the nicest way and gave me a lot of the enthusiasm I have for music from when I told her I was going to learn the piano, even though my parents had said no. But that was the sort of child I was, um, apparently. Uh, she was with us, and, uh, and Prince Charles um, spoke to all my little clan around me on that occasion uh, and was so charming. Even though his aides were trying to move him on, he, uh, he was a cellist himself, and my, my young son was there as well, who was playing cello. Yeah, and he really he really engaged with us all, which is so it made a that made it a very memorable occasion. Lovely occasion, yeah. Mm. Um, so the thing is, Howard, I could talk to you for hours. I really could, <laughs> but I'm very aware I shouldn't take up much more of your time. Um, but before we close, I was just wondering because because you, you do have such a special relationship with London Mozart players, and of course, this interview is for the London Mozart players. So I was just wondering how you think LMP is doing, you know, because we all know the orchestra went through some hard times, how you feel the orchestra's perceived, whether we're sort of heading in the right direction. Uh, oh, pandemic ab withstanding. Ab absolutely. And when you talk about hard times, of course, one's talking about lack of funding and things like that, which so many arts organizations and orchestras are, are, are having to deal with over these last uh, decades. Um, they were always a fine orchestra, even in the, in the hardest times, but they are very, very special now. I think it's taken on a, a new lease of life, and uh, I'm not very good at analogies, uh, analogies as you will have realised, but <laughs> I often think of orchestras like cars, because they're <laughs> that's not a very artistic analogy, but there are certain orchestras, that, orchestras have different personalities, and it's the unique thing about orchestras that, even though the people in them change. In some orchestras, it's slowly over many years. In some orchestras, like our freelance orchestras in London, it can be very quick. Uh, although there's a core of players who you will normally see. Um, but they have personalities and, and uh, some are heavy to take round corners. Some orchestras are heavy to take round corners, you know, which is why the analogy with cars, others, speed round and hold the road like mad and you, you don't have to worry about what uh, uh, speed you go into the corner and things like that. And the, the LMP are so finely tuned from that, from, or well, from all points of view now, so quick to understand what one wants that, of course, we've always worked on short rehearsal time, London orchestras particularly, uh, freelance London orchestras. Mm. Um, but now, you know, one feels one is actually getting somewhere in, in the short time one has, whereas sometimes in the past, it could be a little bit frustrating. You normally got in the concert, but you would have to, um, you know, belt up and hope that, uh, uh, that's seat belts and uh, put your seat belts on and hope that it was gonna come when you needed it to, which is all part of the conducting thing anyway, knowing where, how to, far to push a, an orchestra in rehearsal and how much to leave for the concerts, especially if the concert's only an hour or two later. Mm. But no, they're, 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 it's just a joy to work with them. I, I don't know whether you feel it, but I feel a lot of our first playthroughs of concertos and things in rehearsal are sometimes as exciting as the concerts them, them, themselves because the people, are, the, the orchestra as a group are so in gear all the time yeah. with uh, me and with themselves. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's a very exciting time for the orchestra. It's in brilliant form. And having three amazing leaders like you, Ruth, oh. is, uh, is part of the, <laughs> part of the secret. But, um, well, I'm going to flatter you now by saying I, I just feel we have such a lo lovely rapport with you and that we it always feels so collaborative. It always feels like chamber music. And you have such a lovely rapport with the audience. And I think the audience love the St. John Smith Square series where you you, you manage to explain pieces in, a, in an analytical way that you pitch it just right because it, it's never patronising and it's never sort of too you know um academic in, in a way that people might not understand so you pitch it just right and everybody well everybody just loves you and we love working with you and i've really enjoyed talking to you 
So, Thanks, bless my heart. Thank All you so them. much for your time, and please stay right. safe and well in this pandemic. And uh, well done, what you guys are doing in, in the meantime with these these interviews and things like that. Well done, keep keep it up, and let's hope we will be closer together very soon and I playing our so. yeah, music. Be, it would be lovely to see you on the concert platform soon. Absolutely. Thank Take you great so care. much, Howard. Bye bye. And, uh, Love to all our audience and friends and keep safe and uh, enjoy what the LMP are offering with the At Home series. Bye for now. Bye-bye, Howard. Thank you.